What are genetics? Um, if you are in the muscle building world in any way, shape, or form, I'm sure you've heard the phrase genetics uttered. Um, whether it's someone crying, I've got bad genetics, <laughs> or someone saying, oh, he's all genetics, or whatever, or whatever. Someone just throwing around that term genetics. So the purpose of this video, hopefully in an entertaining manner, is to really help clarify what are people talking about when they say genetics. Um, and I think this video will be entertaining and educational to pretty much everyone. So if you're a newbie and you hear this thrown around after this video, you'll know what people are talking about. Um, but I've talked to a bunch of meatheads, competitors, people have been in this their entire life and don't really think about all the things that actually get thrown in or can get lumped into this category of genetics um, and what all that means. And obviously how that affects your physiques and things that you can influence or not influence. So if I'm gonna talk about genetics, I'm gonna be talking about some of these gents. If you don't know who these people are, shame on you, Mr. Flex Wheeler, Mr. Ronnie Coleman, more recognizable from behind than the front, Phil Heath and Sergio Oliva. So some of the arguably best genetics of all times. So let's get cracking into it. We're gonna start off with story time. So maybe you guys can lament, and I'm gonna talk about Mr. Corey. So this is me kind of coming to realizations with what are genetics? Um, so my freshman year of college, I uh, got put on this floor um, with just probably the most yoked group of other guys like mankind has ever seen. And mind you, I was crazy into working out this time. I literally had mental problems. I was training three times a day through high school. Didn't know anything about recovery, sleeping, eating, didn't care about that. I just liked lifting weights. So as a result of that, at this frame, 5'11", I weighed about 150 pounds. So I don't even know if I look like I worked out in any way, shape, or form, despite having worked out pretty hardcore for like two and a half, three years. Um, and so when I got on that floor, all of a sudden I'm just around all these giant dudes. And I saw this dude named Corey. Corey, if you're watching, I'm still mad at you. I'm still trying to attain your genetics. But I remember seeing this dude, Corey, and I looked at him and I was like, holy crap, this dude is absolutely yoked. I want to look like him. So all I thought about at the time is he was a little bit taller than me. But I remember going up to him and you know, being a meathead, talking about working out muscles, being like, hey man, how much do you weigh? And I remember he told me he weighed 190. So I literally like filed it away in my brain and was like, 190. When I weigh 190, I will look like that. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, when I hit 190, I did not look like that. I looked kind of like a refrigerator. And uh, even when I got like a lean 190 for the first time, I still didn't look like that. Why not? Because of this thing called genetics. And I even remember later on in life, you know, once I was actually putting on some more size, getting a little bit bigger, I'd always followed bodybuilding, followed some of my favorite pros and stuff. And when you're reading it as a kid, you're always looking at like pros are older than you. So I kind of had always in my brain, like I'm still growing. I can still get big. I can get where these guys are. And I remember at one point in time reading an article um, by um, who, who actually did the interview. I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, but it was about Flex Lewis, um, who I'm good buddies with now at this point in time. But I remember reading this article about him, and it was one of the first times, I think I was 20 years old when I read it, um, and it was an article, maybe it was Peter McGough maybe wrote the article, one of the first interviews with Flex before he was pro about this you know, young up and coming British am amateur bodybuilder, Wales amateur bodybuilder, uh, Welsh, Wales, Welsh amateur bodybuilder. And I remember reading about it, and in it, I read that him and I are the same age. And I was like looking at like him, then I was like looking at myself, and I was like looking at him, and I was like, wait a minute, how is this guy so big and I'm so small? And again, aside from work ethic and some other things, genetics. So I'm still mad at Corey if you're out there and you're watching this. And I'm still mad at Flex. I'm watching you, Flex, still. Uh, but so let's get into this. So some of that is hopefully you can empathize a little with my plight. The whole goal of this, like I said, is to better define the term, provide some education, um, give some science even with some of this meathead stuff as well, hopefully make it entertaining. Um, but the thing I say about this also is, you know, having some awareness of that, I think was good for me to realize, hey, I'm not gonna be Mr. Olympia. Um, it's like the same thing as like everyone, like, you know, it's you got your parents that lie to you and say, you can do whatever you want when you grow up. Well, it's like, if you wanna be a linebacker in the NFL, you know, and you're four foot 11, it's probably not gonna happen. And that's not a bad thing, right? Like, I don't think everybody can do any job they wanna do at the highest level possible. You know, we all have things that we're predisposed to do. So some of that is creating some awareness of this genetic thing. I mean, I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to do now because I wasn't blessed with good genetics, because I had to work a little bit harder, think a little bit harder. I think that could help me teach other people to do the same, which is why I'm where I'm supposed to be. So regardless, if you're the type of person that is just scouring the internet for excuses of why your results are mediocre and you don't train hard, you don't eat properly, you don't sleep, you don't do recovery, any of that kind of stuff, and you're trying to find other reasons instead of all those obvious ones, don't watch this video because you'll watch this and be like, oh, I have bad genetics, uh, and cry and just not work hard. Regardless of whatever you've got, 
The best tools available for everyone are still adherence, work ethic, and consistency, right? And I have seen some people, we'll talk about this at the end with my exceptions, at a high level and just at like a normal level that you know really don't have great genetics or just average genetics or even took their good genetics and took them to the level where competing at great. So, I mean, I have seen from natural enhanced, like obviously I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about enhanced athletes, you know, gear, PD use, just a little bit. Obviously that amplifies everything. So again, everything I'm talking about, everyone has access to that. Everyone doesn't have access to genetics. So again, everything that I talk about, whether I do or do not talk about PEDs more, yes, it amplifies. It makes things happen faster and it raises the ceiling where you're about to be. All that being said, we're just gonna keep that just as that levels of play f- playing field. Yes, that's there. Genetics are kind of you know separate from all of that. So again, if you're watching this, this should just be some cool stuff for you, hopefully. Um, but again, what do you do with this information aside from, hey, this is interesting? Well, you still just go to the gym and work as hard as you can and you're gonna get what you get. And uh, that's all any of us can do. So this is where we talk about what categories I'm gonna talk about here. So most people, when they think about uh, genetics, just think about muscle building capacity. Like people just put it on faster, it can put on more, and that's a part of it. But there's some other stuff I think that can go in there as well too, and we'll dig into each one. But structure is in a lot of ways probably the most important, right? So with PED use and with gear, you can overcome a lot of muscle building capacity, especially this day and age with how well people have that part structured as well too. You cannot out gear or out PED poor bone structure. Like if your bone structure is bad enough, like there's nothing under the sun that you can ever do to be Mr. Olympium. Sorry. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But there's also other things as far as muscle bellies, insertions. And these are separate things. People lump those two together very often, muscle bellies and muscle insertions. Muscle separation. And then some other things about people's ability to get lean, stay lean, and then a whole bunch of little miscellaneous stuff we'll kind of cover at the end. So going to dig into these and hopefully watching this, you're thinking, hey, I didn't even think about some of this stuff. Cool. Hopefully you're going to learn some things. So the fun one that everybody talks about up front fun slash can be depressing when you look at how old some of these people are, but you know, it's one, the rate of muscle growth. So some people in a set period of time, just put it on faster than other people. All other things being the same. It's a very common thing with some of the best pros in the world where you hear them say something along the lines of, yeah, I didn't really know what I was doing my first year. I just went in the gym. They didn't really do anything for diet or anything special that anyone else did. And I put on 30, 40, 50 pounds. And that's natural. There are absolutely some natural people out there that could put on between 30, to 50 pounds in their first year of training just because their genetics are that well. And also very often these same people just have a higher capacity, right? So how much muscle Ronnie Coleman put on, not everyone on the planet is capable of putting that on, should kind of go without saying. And so just kind of giving an idea here, depending on who you talk to, which I believe people that were actually there, talk to Milos, talk to guys like Chris Cormier. This is Ronnie Coleman when he was natural, 1991. It said this was like in a 90 kilo class, so I'm guessing he was 198 or under at this point in time. So in the 190s or probably right at the top of the class. And that's pretty insane looking natural physique. So not only is this a high level of muscle in a relatively short period of time for how late he kind of started lifting for bodybuilding, um, it's also just, uh, again, a short period of time and a pretty high capacity naturally. Then we go to O2 and here I believe shortly before his first Olympia win is when he found out about supplements aside from creatine. So that was probably around, you know, 95, 96, I think where other pros were talking to him and talking about supplements and he was literally talking about creatine and things and they're like, no, like supplement supplements. And then someone introduced him to supplements and then we got Mr. Olympia. So that obviously does make a massive difference. But even amongst, so this is amongst pros. So just to give an idea of still the insane muscle building capacity that some people have genetically. So not only from natural to enhanced on stage at O2, about 250 pounds, but between O2 and O3, he went from 250 pounds of stage weight to 287 pounds of stage weight. And obviously stage weight, there could have been some things. He was supposedly a little flat this year, whatever, all that good stuff. But still the fact that a pro at that level could go 37 pounds of stage weight in one year, in one season is insane. That is beyond elite level genetics. That is Ronnie Coleman genetics. So if we're looking at muscle building capacity and we're saying genetics, Ronnie Coleman is probably the best example of insane muscle building rate and capacity. Um, Again, that I don't know if we'll see genetics like this again ever in my lifetime, I'm sure eventually and just some other people to make you cry. So here's Jay Cutler at age 15, Jay Cutler at his peak, quad stomping, uh, but uh, I'm still trying to basically get on this level right now. You're watching this, are probably trying to get on this level. Jay Cutler, 15 year old, is still my goal. <laughs> and then probably the most insane for muscle building capacity and rate, I think, if you look up some pictures, I just have, this is Lee Priest at 12 years old, which again, most people are gonna say negative stuff in my comment section 
um, are people that don't have physiques like this that are probably 25 years old already, but 12 year old, just absolutely yoked. Yes, I'm sure that there was some enhancement in between here and there, but how many walk around the gym and how many other average teenagers uh, find PEDs or find gear use and don't look like this at 19? This to me is probably one of the most insane 19 year old physiques ever to exist. So this is a whole lot of things where all of these people you can see from a young age just have a crazy capacity to put on muscle. They have a crazy capacity to put it on in a short period of time. And then we'll even talk about response to things like gear. There's a genetic component there as well too. But some of this stuff is, I don't care who you are, you look like this when you're 15, you look like this when you're 12, you're just predisposed to be awesome at being huge. So we can look at this and cry together. Still trying to get on that. So this is probably the most important, I honestly, like I said, even more than muscle building capacity because you can't move bones. Now someone out there, there's probably weird stuff where people are shaving their hips and I've seen where like guys are getting taller. I don't know if they make their femur longer or something weird, I don't know. But aside from weird disturbing stuff aside, you can't change your structure. And so bodybuilding is really all about ratios. Yes, some of it is sheer size, but some of it is ratio. So I'm gonna pick on myself here and put myself next to Chris Bumstead, which is not something you ever wanna do. <laughs> um, and aside from everything else about Chris's physique that's better than mine, you know, the bigger quads, the bigger chest and delts and all that good stuff, the biggest thing here is, so I actually have decent clavicle width, but I've got these, I don't, let's see if I can get a pen here. No, all right, pen. Okay, there we go, pen. I've got these wide childbearing hips. These hips are not good for bodybuilding. These are good for childbearing, which I can't do either, so. And these hips are good for being Mr. Olympia. So all other things being the same, even if theory at some point in time, we were the same, he's taller than me, but let's say the same amount of lean tissue, kind of well evenly distributed, similar body fat percentage, he will always beat me on stage just because it creates this. So the more of a V taper you have, the more impressive your physique is. And so the V taper is not just this up top thing, it's also this down here type thing, which we'll talk about as well too. But so when I'm talking about bone structure, realize a lot of it is just sheer, hey, the wider the clavicles, the better, yes, but also it's ratio. So the wider the clavicles, relative to the hips, the bigger the quads relative to the hips, the better overall appearance you'll have. And this is something if you've been to a billion bodybuilding shows, this gets lost in translation standing next to someone or when you're actually looking at somebody um, you know, on stage. You'll have guys on stage where you're like, holy crap, they look nuts. And then when they're off stage later on and they're standing next to you, they don't look quite as crazy because again, those ratios have a crazy effect as far as what their physique looks like. So again, a lot of it is when I'm talking structure, is ratios. Shoulders to hips is probably the absolute most important, but even ratios of what a joint looks like next to muscles, which we'll get into a little bit more than that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ratios too with uh, other limbs. So there's things that happen, whether you have a longer torso, longer arms, longer femur. Um, and in general, I'll discuss this in a second too, the people with the shorter torsos, and I haven't heard a whole lot of people talk about this aside from maybe arms a little bit, tend to also be the people with those best body parts ever. It's very rare that you're gonna have somebody with like these big old long monkey arms like me do, like I do, that's gonna end up having the best arms of all time. Or the same for femurs. Someone generally that's all femurs isn't gonna have necessarily the best quads of all time. And if we look at some of the best of all time, their structure almost always matches that as well too. And then some of that's ratios as well too, where basically what I'm getting at is if you have long limbs, you just got a tough road ahead of you. So again, if you have an 18 inch arm, that's, you know, the, the, the humerus is this long or the humerus is this long, the same circumference, it should just, you should realize that again, from a sheer pound standpoint, if it goes from here to here, you have to put on more pounds of tissue for the same circumference, right? But then there's also this weird thing that happens too, where you get a ratio there that's also not in your favor, where it's again, if you take the same circumference, but attach it to a longer limb, it doesn't look as big. Like our eyes look at circumference as big relative to length. So it's almost like a double whammy where you, again, you have someone that's got a short little humerus, then obviously it's just less actual pounds to hit 18, 19 inches, whatever. But again, that 19 inch circumference relative to a short limb length also creates the illusion of a bigger. And, and again, that can be in everyone's favor. I pick on my arms, but I have femurs that help out my quads for that reason. So looking a little bit more into some structure, some of the best hip to clavicle width that you're gonna get um, going through here. And then obviously looking at some of the clavicle people that we have over here, we got Shanique, Steve, Brian, and then we've got, um, who do I have? Marcus, Dennis Wolf, Phil Heath, obviously. Um, and I use these because these are probably some of the absolute, people talk often about waist. It's not really about your waist. There can be a little bit of structural stuff that goes along with that, rib shape a little bit. But most of the time when people talk about someone having a small waist, it always comes down to hips. 
Um, and again, when you look at these, some of the arguably, uh, Brian here, I can't, Buchanan, I believe is his last name, arguably says the known as the smallest waist of all time, really is the smallest hips of all time. And again, even if the, all of these people do have pretty broad clavicles, it's impossible to not have this type of look, crazy V taper, when your waist is that small. But then you can have something else where we've got Marcus Rule over here who's known for having some of the broadest clavicles of all time, not necessarily the smallest hips, but obviously he's got a shirt on all that good stuff. So he will still create this taper, even if technically his hips, you know, are six inches wider than Steve's over here, he's probably six inches wider up top. So you can kind of offset it. Like again, not everybody has to have everything all perfect. And the example that I think I might've done Phil Heath a little dirty, I put him over top here. So this is an actual picture of Dennis Wolf in front of Marcus Rule. So that should give you an idea of how wide Marcus Rule is because he has Dennis Wolf in front of him, out angling him, and he still looks bigger and wider. <laughs> And then I just superimposed Phil Heath on there. So he might actually be a little bit bigger than that. Sorry, Phil. But Phil's an example of he's not exactly known. One of the knocks on his physique is he has more narrow clavicles, but he also has teeny tiny hips and a whole lot of other stuff going for him. So even if you have some good stuff going on or some not so good stuff, enough of these things that go in this category of genetics can still obviously make an insane physique. If he has narrow clavicles, which you'd say that's bad, well, he's still, again, Mr. Olympia, Mr. Olympia several times over. So it's not that big of a deal. Moving on to some more structure stuff. Um, so this is an example when we're talking of torso to leg ratio. So again, I'm literally looking at, you know, how long is the torso? Oops. How long is the torso? How long is the femur? How long is the femur? How long is the torso? And so again, there's a ratio there where this would be an example. So this is, both of these guys are good examples of shorter, tor shorter femur, longer torso, relatively speaking. So again, even though there's a big height difference here, there's literally probably a foot. I don't remember, like I think Dennis Wolf is over six foot. I think Lee's maybe like five three or five four, I don't know, whatever, but there's a big height difference between the two, but these ratios exist regardless of height. And then you'll have and again the example over here of the opposite. We've got a short torso and a long femur. Now again, this isn't something that there's one that's definitively good or bad as far as aesthetics necessarily go, but this does create some things that I've seen to observe pretty consistently where again, if a guy has a shorter femur, they tend to have the ability to grow better and better looking quads, as you'll obviously see with Dennis and with Lee here, and maybe have a little bit of a tougher time over here. I believe that's Simeo Panda. Um, but at the same time, longer torsos tend to not have as good of backs. And I think it has more so to do with that muscle belly and tendon length type thing. And again, if you're familiar with either of Lee or Dennis's backs, not known as like the best backs of all time, not necessarily matching some of the other stuff that they have going on. So those are ratios that play into genetics as well too, because obviously you can't change that. This is one of the ones where I don't, again, hear people talk about a whole lot, but if we're talking about the best backs of all time, you know, you're gonna have someone like Dorian. I could have picked anyone, but I, these were cool pictures, I thought. Dorian or Kai, where again, if you look at these guys, pen, give me a pen, technology. They have relatively short torsos. Give me a pen, there we go, to relatively long femurs. So again, some of the best, best backs of all time are on shorter torsos relative to longer femurs. Where we've got Tom Platts over here, some of the best legs of all time, I don't have the rest of them, but he was a very short femur guy. So short femur, best quads of all time. And the same thing here with Lee Priest and his arms. So really short humerus, really short upper or lower arm as well too and arguably some of the best arms of all time on there as well too. So even though you hear it pretty often talked about as far as uh, limbs go, legs and arms, and generally the best of all time having them be shorter, there's of course a billion exceptions to that. There's some very tall bodybuilders with great arms and great legs that have those ratios, but this seems to be pretty consistent when you're looking even through the torso at the best body parts of all time. All right, what do we got next? I'm excited to find out. So this is another little thing too. This is a tougher one to show. Um, but sometimes, again, one, your, your structure can also lend itself to a certain degree to what you're good at or not good at. Um, so in general, there are some exceptions, relax, but in general, you're never gonna have the world's, the best strong man in the world is also not gonna be capable of being Mr. Olympia. And some of it is with force production. Let's see if I'm gonna get a pen or not. Give me a pen, man. Pen, give it to me. There we go. So generally, just from a sheer mechanic standpoint, if, if you're looking at basically the mechanics of a column, a wider column can tolerate more load than a smaller column. So if you look at some of the absolute strongest deadlifters or people that can squat a crazy amount of weight, they tend to have these type of midsections. And this is Marius Pujanowski. So even when he was doing strongman, one of the best strongmen, I think he won world strongest man three times or something, maybe one, I don't know. When he was competing, everyone 
would say that he looks like a bodybuilder, which I'll give it to him. He's got great body parts. He always, this is him like just, that's how he competed at World's Strongest Man, very lean. But structurally, he would still get destroyed against a flex wheeler on stage. And a lot of people don't really understand that. But again, that's how genetics, the same genetics that make him ridiculously better and Eddie ridiculously better at deadlifting a bajillion pounds compared to flex, also aesthetically tend to work not in your favor. And that's also true of joints in general. So if you look at the joints of people that are ridiculously strong, they tend to look different than the joints of people that are ridiculously aesthetic. And again, this is a tough one to find good video or pictures of, but when you see people like this in person, you just know. Um, again, and this is one of those kind of structure, weird aesthetic things that a small joint next to a big muscle makes the muscle look bigger. So again, even if we took the exact same thigh circumference here and the exact same thigh circumference here, having a smaller joint here makes it look bigger because it's that ratio type thing. Um, whereas over here, it's not as aesthetically pleasing. At the same time, I can make a mechanics argument that the bigger the joint, not only the better is it possibly for long-term joint health, you just have more surface contact, you have more basically places where you have less cartilage and stuff to wear. But I could also make even an argument from the size of your joint relating to the ability to produce more torque for a given amount of force, but that's a little bit more nerd than we're gonna go today. So um, joint structure is something as a part of structure as well too. And again, just your structure benefiting what you just tend to be you know, naturally good at or not good at. That's why people will kind of gravitate over time towards, there's a reason I think that Flex Wheeler went into bodybuilding. There's a reason Eddie Hall went into strongman and powerlifting type things. Their structure lent itself to that. So muscle bellies. So this is again, a completely kind of um, separate thing. You're gonna hear things, terms, this is kind of what we're talking about, where we're talking about round or bubbly. Those are just generally, they go to any muscle. If we're talking quads, we're talking sweep, we're talking biceps, we're talking peak. And this is one of those weird things where even somewhere in pictures and even on video, it's a little bit lost in translation where you see some of these people in person and it's just like, they look like cartoon character. And we'll go in a minute. I can't think of a better example still than Phil Heath. And if you ever saw Phil Heath when he was competing, like just in a tank top, obviously, let alone, you know, just in trunks, it doesn't make sense. Like you literally look at him and his muscles just have shapes that other people's muscles don't. Um, and the thing that we'll go here is this is entirely genetic. So you could have the exact same like pounds of muscle on someone and it just, again, this is what I kind of go, it just literally grows out as opposed to someone else just kind of grows in a normal way. And again, theoretically why this happens aside, I don't really know. Um, we can make some guesses, doesn't really matter, but it's just kind of is what it is. And I want to clarify, this is separate from insertions. So someone could have, you know, bad insertions and good muscle bellies, or someone could have good insertions or bad muscle bellies. We'll give some example on that. And again, picking on me and my one good body part, people tend to make this mistake and so what I'm talking about looking at my quads is they kind of just that outer part, that outer head, that lateralis just kind of always grew out. So I literally had training partners where if we kind of measured our thighs and yeah, obviously put on muscle everywhere and that helps, but my outer quads just tend to grow out more bubbly. Now I don't have too much bubbly anywhere else in my body, but the thing that's good to know about this too is one, you can't help it. You can't affect it with training, not significantly. Um, and again, some of it's just this genetic type thing. So if somebody's ever trying to sell you round bubbly sweep peak, just know they're completely full of crap. And again, people used to ask me, I didn't know any better. Like, oh, what'd you do to get that quad sweep? And I would just tell them what I would do. But there was a time when I generally thought, oh, it's because of what I do that I have this. And then I'd have training partners for like years on end and their quads didn't look the same. And I was like, oh, maybe it's not what we're both doing. So just realize that's a component as well too. And again, none of this is good or bad, just kind of is what it is. If you want a muscle to have more of these, you know, additives put in front of it, the best thing that you can do is get a bigger muscle, right? So again, it's, even if you don't have necessarily these round, bubbly, sweepy things, a bigger muscle always looks better. So here's some examples of bubbly. Why is this one not all the way out? All right. Um, some of my favorite examples. So again, there's going to be lots of pictures of Phil Heath. And I love when you're looking at pictures of Phil Heath and you necessarily can't tell if they're Photoshopped or not but just literally like the shape of how his muscles, they all stick out. They all just don't grow like this way. They grow like this way and like this way. Um, Flex Wheeler was another example of that. Here's an example that I wanted to share of muscle belly. So again, we've got Albert Beckles and we've got uh, Chris Bumstead. And again, they could technically, let's just hypothetically say their biceps weigh 10 pounds each. This is actually, we'll talk about in a minute. They have very similar assertions. So they kind of have a little bit of longer bicep tendon. Yet for whatever reason, Albert Beckles bicep just grows like that. And Chris is just goes like this. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Everything else you got is good. Shut up. Um, and so again, back in the day, people were like, what do you do for peak? And just whatever he does, 
it looks like it's working peak, but that's just the shape of his bicep. Uh, and so again, I wanted Serge Nubre is one of the best examples as well too. I wish we had more actual video and pictures of him, but his muscles, like their shape, I think his, one of the greatest chests of all time, where it's just like exploding. It looked like his chest was too big for his chest. So if you're ever Serge Nubre, look up some pictures of him. That looks inappropriate. Does it? Smiley face. I'm happy I have big pecs. Um, but if you ever want to look up some pictures of him, there's like an intangible where it's like, even there's, yeah, a lot of guys that have very big chest, but just the roundness and the fullness of it is again, just a genetic thing. And you know, genetics are awesome because even if we don't have that, we can look at that and be like, holy crap, that looks awesome. All right, the smiley face looks awesome. All right, now can I get this off? Get off, drawings. All right, technical difficulty. All right. There we go, I got it. All right. What do we got next? So this is the other component. So we're talking about insertions. I'm sure at some point in time you guys have heard insertions. I'm gonna talk about some stuff you probably commonly hear um, and some stuff maybe that you haven't heard before. But the short story of it is longer tendons bad, short tendons good. Um, and basically this results if, if you have shorter tendons, you have longer muscle bellies and longer muscle bellies is just more real estate to fill out basically. It's just more capacity for growth. So again, one of the really common ones you'll hear, for, you'll hear is calves. And so I don't know who these guys are, but sorry. So this is where their muscle belly ends. Why is that so big? All right, let's fix this. Uh, technology. All right. So this is where this dude's muscle belly ends. This dude's muscle belly ends. Sorry. <laughs> All this length is tendon. All this length is tendon. I mean, yeah, technically some of it's fascist. Coming, someone's gonna say, isn't that the Achilles tendon? What's all? There's no clear cut division between things that we label as fascia and tendon. So just bear with me nerds. But this is all tendon. So again, can you make this bigger? Sure, but this guy is never gonna have the greatest calves of all time, sorry. And this is Eric Frankhauser on the bottom, which even some of these pictures don't do justice, but this is roughly where his muscle belly ends. And this is the length of his tendon. So literally his muscle belly is much longer than his tendon. And you can even see that from the front. Like look at the length of this muscle belly. So that's basically the muscle belly. That's the tendon, like just some nonsensical stuff. And he's known as having some of the biggest calves of all time. Lo and behold, you're not going to get the biggest calves of all time with very long, uh, you know, uh, tendon length. So again, with very bad insertions, you're generally going to have to have good insertions. And again, like I said, this is kind of a separate from a muscle belly type thing. All right, that's working. So here's some other examples you don't hear a whole lot. So here's the bicep thing. So again, whoever this guy is, sorry. So this dude, if you look at basically the length of his upper arm, has a very long tendon. So again, his bicep, his bicep looks fine. He's still got some here. That tends to, that not always if you have longer tendons, tends to sometimes be a little bit more peaky. Obviously we saw that's not the case with Bumstead. Sometimes you just get screwed genetically and you don't have good, you have bad tendons and they don't grow very well. But again, this person will just never have the best biceps all time. And then we have Robbie Robinson here where he actually has a little bit of a longer um, tendon. So it's still good, but then as a result, so again, even maybe you wouldn't technically say he has the best insertions, a little bit of a longer tendon. He's again, one of those crazy examples of just nonsensical peak. Here's Sergio Oliva where again, he has some of the best insertions you have. Like you literally can't see his bicep tendon in there, but it's not nearly as peaky. And then if you're gonna have someone that's in the conversation of best biceps of all time, couldn't find a higher quality, but you get the idea, this is Arnold. Same thing, you can't even see the bicep tendon and it's insanely peaky. So occasionally you get, if you're gonna have a best body part of all time, again, what are we gonna have? You're gonna have good insertions. You're gonna have good muscle bellies as well. And we get biceps that don't even make sense that you rarely see more. Other body parts it's not talked about as much as tricep. So uh, this dude, this is where his tricep ends. So again, he probably gets knocked when he's competing and says, so here's his tricep. I'm gonna outline his tricep. This is the actual muscle belly of this dude's tricep. Sorry if you can recognize your tricep, whoever this dude is. Um, but the muscle belly is just tiny. There's not a whole lot of room for growth. He can make this bigger and bigger as want, but look how long this dude's tricep tendon is. He is just predisposed to not having any area to actually put on triceps. And again, an example, if you can get away with this, this is Ronnie Coleman. This is not the highest quality photo, but this is almost a very similar thing, maybe slightly bigger, but Ronnie Coleman is not known for his triceps. And that's why he has long tricep tendons. So even if you can have some of the everything else, the best in the universe, you can still have some not best insertions necessarily. And then I basically just wanted to show triceps. So I had an excuse to look at Rolly's triceps. So this is Rolly Winkler. Just go Google some pictures if you're not familiar and videos of him. He's another guy, if you see him in person, his muscle bellies and roundness everywhere don't make sense. Like he just literally, it's, 
it looks like muscle is exploding off him. Like he ran out of room for where muscle grows and then just all growing on top of other muscles, just making new muscles. But look at his thing here as well too. So his elbow joint's somewhere around here. Like look at his tendon. It's like this little tiny baby tricep tendon here. And same thing, you still get some of the effect here. So basically anywhere that's not muscle belly, all the way through here, you can see this is the separation of the muscle belly. So this whole hunk of meat is the tricep. Same thing here, this giant hunk of meat. So just from a sheer ratio standpoint here, little tiny area of tendon, giant area for huge tricep. Little tiny area for tendon, giant area for huge tricep. And so again, typically if you're gonna have someone in the conversation of best triceps of all time, like we are in the conversation with Rolly, he's got very good insertions. And like, so again, Ronnie Coleman still did all right in bodybuilding, I think. So none of these individual things on their own, still like a death sentence for genetics. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that all these things technically go into that category. This is another one I don't hear people talk about a whole lot. We talk about it a little bit, but you know, your insertions and your lats, um, and, and this is a whole lot of different things people talk about, but basically your lat tendons, which people talk about the Christmas tree, which is your thoracolumbar fascia. So when people talk about the Christmas tree, they talk about this here. And obviously on some people, this is ridiculously separated, but this is lat tendon. So you'll hear when some people have high lats, this is Dennis Wolf up here, but you see his lat tendon is much longer. And this is even some muscle here that's not technically lat. So his lat is right here and all of this is tendon. And I think not to pick on, but one of the best examples of just got screwed with bad lat tendons is Hide. So all these other picker, pictures are Hide. It's a great, um, he was open, he did great and open. Also a 212 bodybuilder. Um, but look how big his, uh, his uh, lat tendons are. So compare these two pictures on one of these kind of close. This is the border of his lat. He's just got this big old rectangle that is the biggest lat tendon I've ever seen in my life. So all that being said is, and he's not known for his back, even if he was the hardest working trainer in the universe or whatever, same thing here, this is that kind of high thing. So when people say high lats, really what they mean is long lat tendon. And you'll just see that lat just kind of tends to stick up here. And if you're really looking for muscle belly, you have to see close sometimes, you might have this little muscle belly that's that part that sticks to that iliac crest there. Um, but some people just get to the point <laughs> where again, your high lats is really long lats tendon. And again, I don't care how hard you train, it wasn't work ethic that separated these guys' backs from these backs up here, they just got blessed with better tendons. So if you look at like guys like Dorian Yates, and again, some of these aren't, I wanted to have this one because this is a pretty fair apples to apples. Some of these guys are relaxed, but if you look at the bottom of their lats and the lat tendon, where is Dorian's lat tendon? It's this little tiny thing down here. Where's Kai's? This is Kai down here. So this is this giant muscle belly and really small lat tendon. And we got Lee Haney over here. You can't even see it. They wore their pants up a little bit higher in the 80s. That's probably late 80s. And so we don't even know where his lat tendon is. It's right under his belt line there somewhere. But all these guys are in the conversation for some of the best backs of all time. Lo and behold, you know, they have great insertions that are gonna put them in that category as well too. So then we talk muscle separation. So I wanna put this one in here as well too because First off, you'll always see a trend. The most separated bodybuilders of all time are also the most lean, but you'll see exceptions to that. So I say, you know, even separate, let's say hypothetically they have the exact same amount of subcutaneous fat. We do a skin fold and it's the exact same, you know, these super shredded guys, you know, 0.5 millimeters or whatever. Um, even with that being said, some people just show different separation and it likely has to do with different, basically just an anatomical structure of their muscles, how the fibers actually appear and probably has a lot to do with what I'll call fascia. So basically anything between the muscle and the skin, literally the way those are two connected, there's a genetic component in here where some people, quads is just a great example, get these separations all through here, these feathers we call them. So if you ever heard someone saying feathered quads, that's what they're referring to in the quads right here. And I put in here, um, this is Jose Raymond. And so this is a picture, there's a video of him where I think he's showing Rob and Daniel and barely his quads. Um, Jose Raymond is probably one of the leanest 212 bodybuilders to ever get on stage. So when he was getting second a couple times to Flex Lewis, Flex gets shredded too, but he was probably technically leaner. And this is a picture of his quads where he just doesn't have much separation. He couldn't get any leaner. He's got paper thin skin. He's got more vascularity than these guys, but just because of the genetic component, there's something that just makes him show less separation in muscles. Um, and the other thing is it has to be related, I think, to like collagen, because this is something I'll see guys that right when they're very early on in this career, this is more prominent. And again, body fat percentage aside, this kind of tends to fade. So that's why, again, it probably has to do a lot with the skin as much as it does, you know, with the structure of the muscle belly. And so a couple other cool ones where you'll see 
Glutes are obviously a big thing in the bodybuilding world. So if you're not into competitive bodybuilding, I'm not just really into dudes glutes. I mean, I am really into dudes glutes, but it's for bodybuilding reasons. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> but you just see some crazy stuff here. So again, some of this comes with condition. So again, you're never gonna see all this, but all of these levels of separation, this person, this person, oh, come on, man, technology. This person through his lats, his glutes, like literally I used to joke with like flex over here, like I would train with him and then I would lose my car keys in his glutes striations. Don't ask what I was doing with my car keys in or near his glutes. It's a joke. Um, but some of this still is just a genetic component. All of these guys work like crazy, obviously, to get extremely low body fat percentage. But you will see sometimes on stage guys that are, I would guess, of equal body fat percentage where their glutes are just not nearly as dug in. So if you've heard somebody say the term of dug in glutes, that's what it is. It's like these separations in their glutes that look like somebody like here's a glute even if the skin was perfect then somebody went and dug into it with like a shovel or a knife or whatever you're digging with and then obviously i want to show some crazy ones this can happen obviously triceps as well too and it can happen on everything for the most shredded human beings on earth so again that is still very much a genetic component but obviously conditioning will always to a certain degree be at least a requirement and you can really improve on the look of your separation just the leaner and leaner you get but you'll see some guys that get to the point of near death no body fat percentage and they just don't show the same type of separation. And it's outside of their willingness to suffer. Um, so there's a component here. Again, this one is almost completely superseded by just the laws of thermodynamics and being able to diet and work hard. So there's never anybody, in my opinion, that can't get lean enough, that can't get stage lean. It's really just willingness to suffer. But there are some things that go in there. And obviously, you have people like Dexter Jackson. Um, I want to put multiple pictures because he's just awesome. Um, but he's just known as the blade, the blade for his conditioning. And he was also known early in his career for never doing any cardio. I don't want to like um, say, get his words wrong or something, but I might've been like his first 10 years of professional bodybuilding. He literally never did any cardio in addition to obviously what he was doing and dieting to get stage ready. Um, and there's lots of guys like that. And then you'll just have people that you look at it too where just stay continually shredded. Um, again, I know Flex well. I know the Labradas very well. And again, pictures of Hunter in his off season, the dude is shredded all the time. Lee has been shredded for like four decades. If you just see at any point in time, he lifts up his shirt, lifts up, he's got veins. He literally looks like the same level of conditioning of a guy that's like three weeks out at all points in time. And same with Flex. I, when I used to go sometimes and I'd be close to stage conditioning and you know looking and doing some posing with him, he'd occasionally like lift up his shorts to show me how to do a pose or whatever. And he would be more shredded than I was like three weeks out. So then of course I'd go cry and not eat for a couple days just to try and make a pace. But there is something there. I don't think you need to get too lost in the weeds of mechanisms. I mean, people say faster metabolism. There's a whole bunch of things that could go in there. It could be related to insulin sensitivity, all that. So again, yes, there is definitely a genetic component where some people, regardless of the mechanism, just seem to get leaner faster, easier, with less suffering, um, and stay leaner easier, you know, even in their off season as well too. Now again, a lot of this is influenced, I think, by very long-term health decisions that we really can't quantify. Um, but I'm just going to put it there. There definitely is something to it that is genetic as well. Um, then I'll put some miscellaneous responses in here. So this one, I'm not going to give any examples, but I have talked to so many pros where maybe they even had a mediocre response to training. You know, maybe they put on 20 pounds their first year of training. By the time they went on their first cycle, which normally could be this one teeny tiny compound or something or whatever, in 12 weeks they put on 30 or 40 pounds. And again, there's so many guys doing so much crap just in your average gym right now that a lot of people think, oh, it's all entirely PEDs, it's all entirely gear, and it's just not true. Like I said, absolutely, I'm not living in like la-la land, I'm not gonna tell you sand is real, sorry, spoiler alert. Um, yes, it makes a massive difference, but there's lots of guys that think, oh, I'm gonna do this. They go on some gear and over the course of 12 weeks they put on like seven or eight pounds and they get back knee. And they're like, wait, what happened? I thought I'd have these crazy results. It doesn't always work like that for everybody. So I've talked to some people where it's, again, they just had this crazy response. There's, again, there could be a whole lot of things that go in there, but you'll hear a lot of people in the body will talk about hyper responders to gear, and there's definitely something to it. People that do the same thing compared to somebody else and just have this insane, you know, exponentially different response. I put some other ones in here is like, Kai Green, if you talk to people that, not talk to Kai a good bit myself as well too, and people that know him, just had like this insane appetite. <laughs> So the amount of food this guy could put down, because that's a part of it. If you want to get absolutely massive, people don't realize, and I never even took myself, even went upwards of 250 quite this far, but when people are really trying to put like real big dudes, like trying to crack 280, 290, 300, the amount of horribly uncomfortable force feeding you have to do day in and day out, it, it's the worst. And you will literally have guys that mean it, because I've been there and not for as long a period of time, where it's worse than dieting, force feeding, feeling borderline nauseous and full and stuffed all day, and generally trying to eat relatively clean, it sucks. 
Some people don't have that problem. Like Kai, I remember, could literally just, he'd eat like two pounds of chicken in a sitting, giant piles of rice, and just be ready to, good to go for his next meal in 30 minutes, which might make dieting a little bit tougher. But for bulking, there's your genetic component. Again, all these things I kind of put as miscellaneous because you can address them with, yeah, can you improve gut health, blah, 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 that. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but just going to put it there as well too. Muscle retention, I put as a thing here. So I'm going to talk about Ben with two things, but obviously you know Ben and Dana very well. Um, both of those people just hold muscle like crazy. So like when Ben retired from bodybuilding, I remember like, I still think he's probably like 250, relatively lean. And he's literally like, I eat nothing and I'm just trying to lose weight. And his body's like, nope. And so he just holds muscle. Like I miss a meal and I lose 12 pounds. Like not really, but pretty much. And I remember the first time I ever went and trained Dana, uh, literally trained her for two a days for three days straight. I just made up the craziest stuff I ever did. It's all on YouTube if you want to go look at some point in time. I absolutely just beat the crap out of her. I trained her as hard as I've trained any human on earth because that was her request. And uh, the whole time we were there, she ate like on a given day like oatmeal, like one piece of protein, got some cookies at night, and just like is just yoked year round all the time. So again, people discuss Dana's stuff all the time. Is she nutty? Is she not nutty? hang around and see what she's able to not eat and stay yoked. And she just has some absolutely crazy genetics. And then I go into things like training capacity. Ben always used to say in his prime, and if you ever train with Ben in your prime, you know what I'm talking about. People were afraid of training with Ben, rightfully so. I trained with him for several years. He said he was like a 300 pound marathon runner. So sometimes on leg day, he would just bully people for fun. I was on the receiving end of that a lot. Where it's, you ever actually done like a legit, like 20 or 25 working sets during a leg day, where things are actually to failure on these big movements. And his body was just built to tolerate that better than other people, and he'll say that himself. Um, so there is a genetic component to training capacity. And this one I won't really go into any, because again, there's so many other things that could be outside influence of that, but some people do just seem a little bit more injury prone genetically than other people. Um, so again, there might be some genetic component there, but a lot of these things too could just be, some of it's a lifestyle type thing as well too, and can be influenced, like I said, when we're going into appetite and stuff like that. Oop, what did I do? All right. So if we're in the conversation of best genetics of all time, so looking at all those categories, like how does somebody get into that conversation? They're generally gonna have almost all of those categories in a really good spot, right? So if we look at Ronnie Coleman and we go through some of those things, especially if you look back at those early pictures of Ronnie when he was young, and he got so big at some point in time, you lose it, but you can still really see it. He has very narrow hips. He has very broad clavicles. He's a good height for bodybuilding as well too. I think the average height of like a Mr. Olympia is around five foot 10. So there is a size component to it as well too. So structurally he had the pre uh, prerequisites of narrow hips, broad clavicles. Obviously we know that he has probably some of the best muscle building capacity of all time. Literally hit a stage weight and size combined with conditioning we'll probably never see again. And then if you look at everything else though, everything else was pretty good. He's not known for like saying that he's got these crazy round muscle bellies. Most of his muscles were just so insane because they were so big and he was so damn shredded. So even if you wouldn't put this, so we're looking at some of the things, he has pretty good insertions, pretty good muscle bellies. We even look at some things like triceps where maybe they weren't the best. But if you just get so massive and you have such good structure and you get so lean, then you can have enough stuff to be considered one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time. Then if we look at someone like Phil, look at pictures of him when he was a basketball player. His muscle building capacity, he just from picking up basketballs and picking up some weights here and there for fun, was again, bigger than I'll probably ever be. And I always just had these things with the muscle bellies. Everything like, that's the thing I love about Phil, is you, when you look at pictures of him, like luckily a lot of these are pre-Photoshop era, but you have to look and be like, holy crap, is that real? And it's like, yes, that's real. So even though he had basically one knock on his physique, structurally slightly more narrow clavicles, he also had teeny tiny hips. He has arguably some of the, if not the best muscle bellies, the best insertions as well of all time. And then from a capacity standpoint, when you have, he still got whatever his stage weight was at his peak, probably around the 250s, still had enough capacity to, one, had a, uh, a capacity to put it on quickly, had a high enough ceiling to look to the point where, like a lot of these guys, they actually probably maybe even arguably got too big at some point in time, but then was able to hit a level of conditioning muscularity combined with some of the craziest muscle bellies of all time, and that's why he's in the category of, or the conversation with best genetics of all time. And then we got Flex Wheeler again, and he's probably the guy that a lot of people say, was the best combination of genetics ever. And so what does that mean structurally? Some of the absolute tiniest hips, some of the absolute broadest clavicles, arguably the only person that's in a conversation with the type of muscle bellies that Phil had with just some of this crazy insane roundness. The same thing, some people thought he was his best probably when he was around 220 pounds on stage, but had the capacity, got up to being 265, close to 270 I think on stage at some point in time. So again, if we're looking at structure, muscle building capacity, muscle bellies, insertions, 
he probably had more stuff going than any other bodybuilder of all time, but the only thing he never had quite to the level, definitely not to the level of Ronnie Coleman, definitely not to the level of Phil, was conditioning. And again, that wasn't a genetic component. Like I said, at the end of the day, you can take conditioning absolutely as far as you want. Generally, we're just at that level of willingness to suffer. So um, when we're talking about best genetics of all time, you can see how these guys come in the conversation because of all those categories they have. They either have the majority of them or all of them. If not good, then an absolutely great or best of all time conversation. And then the last one I wanted on here, I think this is the last one. Yeah, the last one I wanted on here is this idea of exceptions. Now again, some of these exceptions are still pretty exceptional. Um, but so even if we look back where we're talking about Sergio Oliva, and there's a whole lot of conversation, so don't get bodybuilding political on me or whatever. But if you look, Sergio Oliva was known for having some of the best genetics of all time. And you can just see him standing relaxed next to Arnold. Look at the difference. Oh, technology. It's more entertaining for you guys, seeing that not work. Arnold kind of got those childbearing hips. So not the best hips for bodybuilding. Back then you were able to get away with a little bit more of a pose. So this is a very rare pose of Arnold from the front where he didn't have a little quarter turn on his hips or his hips to the set offside a little bit. Um, so again, back then you could actually kind of offset this a lot with posing, but to a certain degree in these front poses when he didn't have his hips twisted because of Sergio Oliva's crazy, crazy tiny hips and broad shoulders, he actually made Arnold look a little bit like a refrigerator. Still a jack refrigerator, but a little bit like a refrigerator. And then arguably even had some kind of better muscle bellies. I mean, Arnold had some of the craziest chest biceps of all time, but all of Sergio Oliva was kind of this round and bubbly type thing. But supposedly he was never quite in the level of conditioning as Arnold. And then supposedly there's a lot of politics that surround Arnold in his bodybuilding career, especially when you're getting to 1980 Mr. Olympia, but that's for a separate video. So, but there are times where these for sure aren't world-class, the best hips in the world, but he seemed to still do all right from a bodybuilding standpoint. And so someone's even going to say, well, how do we have, you said a whole bunch of times, and a lot of people said that Flex Wheeler is some of the best genetics of all time, but he was never Mr. Olympia. And so a lot of people will compare the times, obviously he was competing at the same time as Dorian Yates. And some people will mistakenly say, because people will say that Flex Wheeler had better genetics than Dorian. And if we look at all those categories, I would agree. But people will then make the mistake and say, well, Dorian had bad genetics. Dorian did not have bad genetics. He had world-class genetics as well too. Probably the two categories that uh, Flex beat him a little bit is he definitely had more narrow hips. So, you know, Dorian had a teeny bit wider hips. Now he didn't have wide hips. He didn't have Joe Bennett hips. But compared to standing on stage next to Flex, this is the thing if you look at old videos or you ever there in person, you can see the effect was just more dramatic V taper. Now again, Dorian still had broad clavicles, so he still had a great V taper. But then you also look at muscle bellies. I mean, especially if we look at things like arms, Dorian was not necessarily known for these crazy round bubbly arms. And none of his muscle bellies were just kind of this type thing, where all of Flex's stuff just kind of grows straight out. So again, then people say that he didn't quite have the genetics maybe that Flex did. It's those two things that are talking about that are a big deal. Structurally, bone structurally, not quite as good. And from a muscle belly standpoint, not quite as good. Now that being said, from a muscle building capacity, I don't know if he had better genetics or not than Flex, probably not. I think he just outworked him. And then from a conditioning standpoint, when we're talking about all this crazy stuff that we see here, you know, all the crazy where the first guy on stage probably ever in 250 plus with shredded glutes, um, he just outworked him. So this is the idea of exceptions. If I could say, hey, how is this the guy that had the best genetics of all time? And he's in that discussion. Dorian's generally not ever in that discussion. Those are the things that kind of keep Dorian out of that discussion. But again, the exception is if you have enough work ethic, if you do enough of the right stuff, obviously everybody had access to PEDs. Again, we put that aside. You can really overcome your genetics. And then I put Michaela up here as my favorite example of the exception category, where again, if you would have asked me, and I probably did say this at some point in time when Michaela was early on in her bodybuilding career. So I think she was actually starting at figure. I don't know if she ever actually competed at figure but then was doing women's physique for a long period of time and now into women's bodybuilding. If you look at structurally what she has going on, you'd look at this and this is what joke. She's got that beautiful, no V taper. She's got the beautiful refrigerator. So no V taper re refrigerator structure. But over time, the combination of getting leaner and putting on a whole lot of muscle, if we actually look, obviously her hips didn't get more narrow. Her clavicles didn't get any broader. So if we actually go bone to bone, still pretty much the same refrigerator, but being a little bit leaner here makes this look like it comes in a little bit here and then putting a crap ton of muscle on out here. And then again, what do we have here? The bottom of this refrigerator extends right down to her quads. Well, now we build the quads. Maybe we'll do this red. This will be a good opportunity for red. We got a different color here. So we can see what I'm talking about, not on the back, but this is where her quads are now. 
So you can't change your structure, but you can outwork genetics with enough of that stuff that I said in the beginning. And I've yet to see another human being, if you don't follow Michaela Aycock, you should just learn how you should do bodybuilding if you want to exceed your genetics. Someone's gonna say, oh, PDs, blah, blah. Guys, I get it. Stop saying that over and over. Go complain about it in the comment section. Nobody here has access to anything different than anybody else does, um, but there are some things that they have access to with work ethic and things like that. So again, if you're watching any of that whole thing and you're slightly depressed about your genetics, just realize there's exceptions at a high level. And Michaela is what I would take from just very mediocre genetics. She probably does have above average capacity of putting on muscle. Um, but the only thing that she really has that is above, 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 above average, uh, elite, elite level over everyone else is nothing to do with genetics and everything to do with work ethic. So she does more uh, work and more adherence on a day-to-day -day basis than anyone I've ever seen. And so all that being said, even if you don't have the best genetics you've determined after watching this video, you can still outwork, you can still be an exception if you actually do work hard enough consistently for a long period of time. I mean, this took, I believe this was a 10 year time frame, So this doesn't happen overnight. Um, but if you literally put 10 years of doing things perfect, it is insane what you can attain and at all levels. Whether you want to stay completely natural, of course, you can have something equally just insane in your own right. And then obviously if you get to the level of competing and doing it for a living in a non-tested federation, obviously your ceiling is going to be higher of what your end can look like. So hopefully you guys found that enjoyable. This was fun for me to break down and look for a billion old pictures um, to try and show you guys what I was talking about. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, like I said, I hope you enjoy this one because this one took me a billion years roughly to put together and get just the way that I want it. Um, but if you have questions, comments, concerns, get down in the comment section below. If there's other stuff you want me to cover in a similar manner to this, let me know. And as always, if you want to support the channel, do the YouTube thing, like, subscribe, share with somebody that you know that has bad genetics, which is everybody that you know. Um, and if you want to support another way down in the description, try out my app, get some killer workouts, logbook tracker stuff, ask me some questions on the forum. Um, and yeah, as always, I appreciate you guys until the next one.